Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Gulf Coast Acoustomologies, tonight's iteration and continuation of the series Anthroposonic. I'm Rebecca Snedeker, and I direct the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South at Tulane University. And we are an interdisciplinary place-based institute that supports the understanding of this region and its relationship to the global and the planetary. All of our programming is based on the belief that the more we understand where we are, the more fully we can engage in our democracy and our collective destiny. Our assistant director, Dr. Denise Frazier, and I co-conceived of and launched the Anthroposonic series two years ago in fall 2021. And since then, we've featured an artist or ensemble each semester who is collaborating with and creating compositions in collaboration, collaboration with non-human entities, as in a river, a whale, or an oil rig. We want to thank our faculty colleagues in the Newcomb Department of Music who have partnered with us on different presentations in this series, including Courtney Bryan, Jesse McBride, Ana Maria Ochoa Gautier, Matt Sakakini, and Lee Viragavan, and their chair, Dan Sharp. Each year, we've hired a graduate student from the music department to work on our team, and we've commissioned work by those students, Ryan Clark and Demi Ward, that will be presented tonight. Anthroposonic is funded through the Center's Music Rising at Tulane program and through a generous grant from Newcomb Institute's Dorothy Beckmeyer Scow Art and Music Fund. And we also want to thank Laura Walford, who has served as Newcomb Institute's interim executive director throughout the academic year for her support, and to welcome Anita Raj, the incoming executive director, to Tulane. I also want to thank Regina Cairns, our executive secretary, as well as all of the artists additional faculty, students, and audience members in our ecosystem, and extend gratitude to each of you for being here this evening, alive and present, and tuning into your surroundings here on this Monday evening in spring 2024. A few housekeeping notes. The evening is being documented by Tulane Libraries. Thank you, Alan. And it will be posted on our Vimeo page and on the more mundane, the restaurants, excuse me, no restaurants, <laughs> the restrooms are out these double doors at the top of the room. Um, and then when you exit those, you can take your first right and then another right, and the bathrooms will be on your left, right around there. This evening's program includes two movements, if you will. Part one will begin with Anthroposonic Reflections, which is a brief look back at the history of the Center for the Gulf South's music and soundscape programming from around 2011 to today with Dr. Denise Frazier, Ryan Clark, and myself. I'll guide us on a brief history of the Center's music and soundscape programming from the early years through Anthroposonic, and then Dr. Frazier will speak in more detail about the Anthroposonic series and then Ryan Clark will speak about organizing listening to Southern Resistance and the creation of a short film that he created last year. In part two, we'll move to anthroposonic seismic studies and a reflection of work from this year. Corey Diane will present their research, Gulf Coast Epistemologies, and then for this year's Live Sound Lab, their Electric Acoustic Ecology Ensemble, which includes Corey Diane, Clementine Hartman, and Peter Bowling, will perform Reverie for the Balian of the Gulf of Mexico of many and no known names. And finally, our gathering will close with a composition by Demi Ward. And he will, they will speak about the creation of the composition we commissioned, which was playing when you entered and will also be playing as the event closes. So I'm gonna go right into the part one, Anthroposonic Reflections. So after this first two years, with the Anthroposonic series, we wanted to take this opportunity to share this background of how we got to where we are. Music Rising at Tulane, this program has evolved from a focus on regional music and cultures of the Gulf South toward incorporating music and sound studies in the context of environmental studies and concepts of the Anthropocene and the plantation scene, or more broadly to say, to explore music and sound studies at the intersection of cultural and planetary health. The Center for the Gulf South launched in 2011 and fairly quickly received a $1.5 million grant from the Music Rising Foundation. And I'm going to show a few slides. Can you all hear me OK? okay. These, uh, these first two slides are screen grabs from this website. Uh, as, some of you, as some of you know, the Music Rising Foundation was a post-Katrina initiative spearheaded to give instruments to musicians after the federal levy failure and urban flooding. And it was led by producer Bob Ezrin and you 2s The Edge. Under the leadership of doctors Larry Powell and Joel Dennerstein and Karen Celestan and an advisory council and faculty cohort, the team created an extensive dig digital humanities website. 
as well as university and K-12 curricular resources and a coordinate major for undergraduate students. Much of this content was organized by genre, including jazz, blues, Zydeco, R&B, and bounce. In the fall of 2015, I started my tenure as executive director of the center almost eight years ago and inherited this Music Rising program. Now, as I was thinking towards the future of the music programming at the center, I noticed that the site content was, at the time, almost all male. There were a few female vocalists, but very few female and female-identified instrumentalists and few living artists. So I was interested in creating public programming with a wider diversity of musical voices for educational purposes and also to add to the documentation of this regional humanities website. That first semester, I worked with arts educator Sonia Robinson, who many of you know, who was our K-12 educator engagement director. And we created one-day workshops for K-12 teachers in the region and also prepared a grant to the NEH to host a landmark workshop for American history and culture. We chose New Orleans as our, as our national landmark and explored the parallel and intersecting histories of the creative expression and musical cultures and art forms here with civil rights, with the history of civil rights, with a team of about 40 artists, scholars, and civil rights activists. In fall 2016, Dr. Denise Frazier started her tenure as assistant director of this center, and I was, of course, thrilled to welcome her strengths as a Latin Americanist, performance artist, musician, and Houstonian, and beautiful human being. And, uh, when, and she had started by the time we received the good news for the, for the NEH funding, and we brought Bruce Sumpai Barnes on board as workshop co-director, and hosted this week-long experience for two different summers. I forgot about the slides, so I'm going to show some slides now. <laughs> so these are just some screen grabs from the website. And some images from the programming with K-12 students in the region. This was at the Homer Plessy School when it was in the quarter. And these are images from the NEH workshop that we hosted. And here's our workshop co-director, Bruce. Welcome. These are also images from that teacher workshop. We also started a tradition of pulling together all, of this, all the courses that we could find out about at Tulane that focused on New Orleans and the Gulf South region. And every uh, semester we choose two different individuals, one historical and one contemporary, uh, to put at the top of our posters. Right. <laughs> and we've been like called out several times for who we put. We have, we do not, we're not heroicizing any of the people on the posters because none of us from the region are perfect. They're, they're, maybe, they're not for sale, but that's, thank you for asking. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, will, uh, we are gonna, we, we're working on like publicizing what we've done and, um, and sharing our documentation and materials. So we're really in a phase of, which is part of why I'm telling this story tonight. Um, so yeah, thank you for asking. So one of the reasons we did those posters was um, not only because of the musical cultures of the Gulf South academic major, but also just for, the, for our community at Tulane to be able to see the rich, and, like, rich array of coursework that relates to this place because of this idea that we believe that we can be learning from our surroundings and that enriches our lives and our ability to show up as individuals in the world. We also, um, around 2018, started an Indigenous Studies Symposium now called the Tulane Gulf South Indigenous Studies Symposium, and, um, and every year have brought in different people who speak about mus indigenous music to help fill in these um, gaps that many of us have experienced of not knowing enough about the indigenous presence, the ongoing indigenous presence and vitality in music from New Orleans and Bulbancha. And we partnered with Rachel Brenlin from Neighborhood Story Project and Bruce Barnes again um, to create a series called Lunion Creole, which was a, concert, a spring concert series at the Neighborhood Story Project in the Seventh Ward and Oral History Project. And for three years, uh, during January through May, we co-organized uh, concerts that began with oral histories of the musicians who were playing that evening, uh, and then followed with, with concerts. And that project is a book and album project that we hope to release in 2024 or 2025. These are some images. And um, that concert also was, uh, we were fortunate to be, uh, like, how do I say this? To, 
be present for the first iteration of the Les Sinel Ensemble <laughs> that Denise and Joe Derensberg founded. These are some images from Inside Neighborhood Story Project at, um, at Roger Lewis's uh, performance. We've also partnered with faculty on many occasions. Um, and this evening, we hosted an event with co filmmaker Colleen Smith and composer Courtney Bryan. We've had several programs similar to that over the years. And also through our research fellowships, we've funded research related to, to music in the region. And these are some images from Matt Sakakini and Abdul Aziz's uh, project and Kyle DeCoste and, a, and um, Ana Ochoa Gautier and a, German scholar Gwendolyn, who is looking at the relationship of accordions and horses in Zydeco music. We've also hosted several like immersive uh, educational experiences. This was a, um, a trip related to the history of bounce music that moved throughout the city. And there's some images with Cheeky Black and dancer Marissa Joseph and a, uh, a stop at Peach's record store. So we do a lot of these immersive place-based experiences with students, faculty, and the public. And finally, I want to sort of uh, finally ebb toward Anthroposonic by saying around 2018, we accepted an invitation to host the culmination of a two-year study of the human impact on the Mississippi River called the Anthropocene River Campus. And that project was one of the times where we really, it's really a formative foundational experience for us to move uh, into studying the history of human impact on Earth and planetary change. And we met some sound artists and ethnomusicologists. Here's an image of Monica Holler and of Matt Rahim, um, who also were, were using sound and music to explore our relationship to the planet. Around that time, I met a um, geophysicist named Ben Holtzman, who's done a lot of work. He's at Columbia's uh, Computer Music Center, looking at creating data sonification and using sound as a way to uh, help humans perceive scientific data. So he was working on the, how, do, how do earthquakes sound and the fact that when an earthquake happens, the earth rings like a bell and making audio and visual images of that to help us understand the phenomena. And I thought like, wow, who, who is doing that in our region? Which is like a jumping ahead to Corey Diane's work tonight. <laughs> um, so basically through, through this work in, in, I guess in some, we just want to say that while we still very much support like just straight up beautiful forms of music and the incredible depth of music language in our musicians who perform and live here and the, like, the continuity of that, we're also really welcoming in these diverse voices, these collaborations between humans and non-humans, and, um, and welcoming you all to engage in this exploration with us. Tonight's program is so beautiful. Thank you for listening to my long introductory remarks, and um, I'm going to pass to Dr. Frazier, who's going to describe more about the Anthroposonic series. Mics on mics on mics. Um, if you know this song, please sing it with me. Do you believe in life after love? Love after love after love. I can feel, wait, something inside me say, I really don't think you're strong enough. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know why I just sang that song. Okay, I am not surprised. <laughs> um, <laughs> This was a new discovery for me, and I'm happy to share with you all. Um, Geophysics physicist uh, engineer uh, Dr. Andy Hildebrand created algorithms to support seismic studies to map the surface of the Earth using sound waves. He used the same algorithms to use audio to detect pitch in humans, and thus AutoTune was born as a pitch correcting device. Welcome to Anthroposonic. <laughs> you, you've already been in it since the 90s. <laughs> oh, earlier than that, Stevie Wonder. I just want to put that out there. Um, so Anthroposonic basically seeks to stretch our understandings and appreciations of how we collaborate with non-humans and how we realize the interdependence of our species and plants and animals and machines. Michaela Harrison, um, our first anthroposonic artist, last fall, 
Our journey began with a profound work of Harrison's acclaimed whale whispering project, a holistic aquamarine project based on her work with the humpback whales off the coast of Bahia, Brazil. Harrison asks to be one with the earth. She asks us to also contemplate the middle passage and to attune ourselves to the songs of our environment. And this is um, a partnership on a whale whispering a sonic experience at Lincoln Beach with Ashe Cultural Arts Center for Imagining America. We also have these um, wonderful little um, actions that we did on the beach at Lincoln Beach. And this is Cootery Forest. This was the very first whale whispering that um, we did with um, community, Tulane students, faculty, and staff. And here we are again at another whale whispering um, by the Crescent City um, in the park. Okay, so the professors, music professors. Um, this work would not have been possible without the support of a Newcomb Department of Music. I remember when I first asked Courtney if um, she would be interested in joining in this project and, and you were down and um, I was, very, I was very happy for that. Um, so I wanna just shout out Lee, Ana Maria, Jesse, uh, Courtney again, Matt and Dan um, for all of, our, all of your support. And as Rebecca already indicated, the SCOW um, was fundamental to making this, um, this dream come true. Um, I wanna continue on to Lisa. Uh, Lisa E. Harris was our second anthroposonic um, artist from another Gulf city, Houston. Uh, last year, Lee was a rising resident at a studio in the woods, and we also thank them. Um, Anna Monroe Fellow, whose work related music to the life cycle of oil wells. So her live performance lab, which was filmed by Ryan, um, playfully and thoughtfully helped us consider concepts as diverse as gentrification, how we envision and treat the earth to the current issues of nurdles uh, gathered and sweeping along our coastal waters. And um, I will just go through some of the actions that we did with Lisa. And I will move on to our most recent Anthroposonic, which was with Lost Bayou Tours. And so we took community members, students, a uh, wonderful Fulbright scholar, Daniela, who is um, with us this semester, and Tulane staff along Lily Bayou, where Demi Ward documented most of the sound for a beautiful soundscape um, that we'll play again if you didn't get a chance to listen to it on your way in. And uh, we learned about coastal erosion and wildlife in the swamps, and this is something that we hope to continue again soon. So these are just some pictures from that experience by one of our guides, John Hazlitt. So now with this next slide, I will turn it over to Ryan to discuss Listening for Southern Resistance, um, an anthroposonic program that we co-created last year that led Tulane students, professors, and staff, and community members to examine three sites of environmental infrastructure and activism, um, the residents of Gordon Plaza, the Bonnie Carey Spillway, and Rye St. James members. So thank you. Okay, um, so as Denise was speaking to, I uh, heralded, took part in um, uh, Listening for Southern Resistance, which was an, sort of an excursion that went through the petrochemical corridor between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. It was planned to get to Baton Rouge, but we made it to Norco, Donaldsonville, and here in New Orleans with Gordon Plaza, which is where we started. Um, really the, the exercise was an act in the field of acoustic ecology, that's what it was based on, but went a bit more beyond that to try to engage with the plantation scene, whereas um, I believe R. Murray Schaefer was the guy that uh, coined the term in the field acoustic ecology, and it's a bit too based in some kind of like strange nationalistic conservative pride so avoiding that i was hoping that we could engage it with um resistance and so we spoke with rye st james and miss uh, sharon as well as travis london uh with jessica dandridge with the water collaborative uh, but we began in gordon plaza where we spoke to some of the residents there 
where part of this sound listening activity was uh, by the people that live there. So through acoustic ecology, we wanted to listen to the health of the environment, um, but not in a purely non-human way, that these people uh, who live there are a part of the environment and have something to say. Uh, and engaging with acoustic ecology, uh, I think it's a really important practice to begin to listen and engage with knowledges that aren't purely um, didactic or spoken directly to. And so it provides a bit more of a sort of somatic awareness that what we're residing in, we're taking in information regardless of if it's being spoken to us. Um, so yeah, Bonnie Carey Spillway, this is Rebel Town, which we didn't get to, but I think it's just an important image to understand just really what's going on here uh, in a single image. But uh, the Bonnie Carey Spillway was an effort in uh, engaging with the infrastructural uh, tension that happens uh, across generations. It was first uh, Sellers, Louisiana, where it was a plantation, which was then sort of um, wiped out by uh, Native, Amer Native Americans were there before colonialism does its thing. And um, where the Bonnie Carey Spillway was then built in the 1920s uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers, where it leads out is through, uh, is go going over a Native American burial ground, which was then uh, bef uh, which was then a, uh, a slave burial ground as well. And so trying to engage with all of these sorts of layers or, or strata of events into a single place, um, I think it's just a really important uh, way to engage ambiently, but also intentionally with the environment. Travis London, Jessica Dandridge, and Miss Sharon took part in uh, the trip. We got on uh, two or one bus, and uh, it was really uh, one enjoyable connection to uh, to spend the day with these beautiful people and and listen to their own experiences and, and knowledges that um, have either been censored or minimized or shut out uh, altogether. Uh, there's me. There's Miss Sharon. There's Anna. We're having a great time. And then lastly, we stopped right in front of the then proposed, which I believe is now canceled, 9.4 billion Formosa uh, plan. It's called the Sunshine Project. And we did a sound mapping exercise, which is basically sort of a sonar engagement uh, activity where if you imagine yourself to be the, not the center, but just uh, the point of reference on a piece of paper and you're listening and basically making a, a mapper making a cartography of the things that you can hear with the birds. Um, what you can't see is, um, you know, some tractors, um, pipelines, things like that. And um, I think that's about it. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like, so lastly, what I did in this room here with the Anthroposonic, with Lisa E. Harris, was uh, pretty much like a videography um, exercise that, although she did discuss nurdles and plastics and things like that, what we're going to watch is more so of an impressionistic take of what it felt like to be in this room, which was just a really communal activity of uh, collective listening. So we might not get the um, the academic portion, but... That doesn't always matter. So we'll start here. It was so gorgeous. The humidity was low. The mosquitoes weren't there. There was like wind. You know, I had just enough layers. It was like everything was like really lining up. And for that, we give thanks. So let's just take a moment today and just, you know, Give thanks for a little bit of the greenery.
to you all a little bit about dreams. Okay, we're just going to jump around a little bit because this is an L-A-B, a lab, which means that you can jump around. So how many of you remember your dreams? Yeah? Okay, hands down. How many of you do not remember your dreams? Do not, like, none of this, I want the ones who really do not remember their dreams. Raise your hand. Y'all believe that, huh? Maybe. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll take that. Um, it's okay if you don't remember your dreams. A lot of people don't remember their dreams. Now, the thing is, this question's a little loaded because it's like, do you remember your dreams? But, can you believe or be dreaming right now? Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello, everyone. Hi. Um, my name's Corey Diane. You can just call me Diane. I um, want to thank Ryan and Denise and Rebecca for having us. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to do kind of a quick little talk. I'm going to try to be quick about it a little bit, uh, because then we're going to present some music. So I want to give a little bit of an overview of the research and science and context and ethic that has brought some of this music into the world. Um, and then uh, with my really beautiful collaborators, Clementine Hartman and Peter J. Bowling, we're going to share some soundscapes with y'all. Uh, can everybody hear me? OK, cool. Uh, how y'all feeling? Word. Um, I just need to shake a little bit. I need to get some energy movement. Um, so over the past couple years, uh, general understanding that the Gulf of Mexico is home to a unique and distinct species of whale is growing. People tend to know that. Do you all know that? Um, and in January of 2021, so just a little more than a year ago, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association announced that they were naming a whale, the Rice's whale, Baleonetra Risei. And the media really took it on in a different kind of way. They took it on in this, a new whale has been discovered. Can you believe that? In 2023, we're discovering a whale. Um, um, and it spoke to a degree of, of hubris. And the reality is that people have been in relationship to this whale for time immemorial. Um, but just 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 70 years ago, it was rather fringe in the field of marine biology to say that there was a resident whale in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and when they were given the name Rice's Whale, they were named after a Gulf Coast marine biologist named Dale Rice, who in the mid-1950s found a strange, unique skull washed up on the shore of Louisiana. Um, and he started ad advocating that there was a unique whale, unique to the Gulf Coast waters, um, and that was a very fringe belief. Um, and I actually, oh, I had some technical difficulties earlier today. And so I just, I don't know, I'm telling you that, forget that. Um, I was thinking about not putting a picture of this whale on the slides. 
One, because they're kind of elusive and kind of evasive. Um, and just in 2017, when there was a big report on their endangered status put out, one of my favorite quotes from that is, there is no official description of this whale, <laughs> um, even in 2017. Um, in some of the research I'm going to talk about later, um, they talk about how it's so bizarre that while they're accumulating all of these recordings of their songs, they're really rarely cited. Um, and so, uh, for the sake of giving a short little presentation so that we can get to the music, what I'm actually going to do is really a distillation of some of the science, and I'm going to present some of the beautiful science that has been happening really over the past 50 to 70, 70 years, and especially the past 20 years, um, because they weren't just discovered uh, in 2021. Uh, can we move to the next slide, Dr. Frazier? Um, so, in the 2000s, these whales were starting to be called the Bruda's whale. Um, and Bruda was a Norwegian colonizer of South Africa who was a whaler. And when they started to recognize our, these whales of the Gulf of Mexico, they decided that they were close kin of the whales that Mr. Bruda brought to near extinction off the coast of South Africa. Uh, there's, a, there's a part of the naming of whales and of taxonomical science in general that can reinforce and sometimes replicate and sometimes do colonialism. Um, and so this is from a 2014 study, but you'll see the yellow dots are uh, unidentified baleen sightings, and the pink dots are known uh, baleen sightings, Bruda's, Bruda's whale sightings. This is from 2014. So what, one thing that we're going to talk about here is the, is the ways that sound has been really useful and essential um, in uh, understanding these whales and increasing our understanding of these whales um, and affirming that they exist and that they have a right to exist and that they have a right to be recognized as a community. Um, yeah, so we can move to the next slide. Um, it's the same image, um, but what's in a name? I, you can tell I'm like kind of caught up on this name stuff right here. Um, so they've gone through a lot of names. Rice's whale, what they got right now. Bruda's whale. Um, before that, Mr. Rice, was calling them the Gulf Coast whale. That was starting in the 50s. Um, but even before that, before they decided to call Bruda's whale Bruda's whale, their cousins were called the Eden's whale, which are an Indo-Pacific baleen whale, closely related to these whales as well. Um, Eden was a British dude who was a colonizer in the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, so I want to also present a couple other names. We got Balen, Louisiana Creole for whale. We got Yamha whale. Ishakoi for big, powerful fish. We got Nani Chito, Choctaw for great, big fish. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit more talking, but I want to say, long live Nani Chito, Yamhueo, Balen, the rice's whale, the, the baleen of the Gulf of Mexico of many and no known names. Oh. Yeah, we can move on. OK, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to be real quick. Y'all with me? Can I? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, there's a couple things I want to distill in this presentation. One is the importance of sound in marine conservation. Uh, one is the significance of song in the story of these whales. And uh, another is the unique way that sounds, sounds of, of extractive economy, of capitalism, um, of oil extraction, um, uniquely endanger these whales as well. So starting after the BP oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon disaster, is when we first got the first concerted efforts to use underwater recording in the Gulf of Mexico uh, to study the health of marine mammals, marine life, uh, and also uh, the impacts of the oil spill on them. Uh, and so 
A standard practice is called passive acoustic monitoring, PAM, and the standard practice is to do floor-mounted recording units. So after the oil spill, they put seven units in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the top ones, um, like H3, 4, 5, and 6. That's kind of that same pink spread from earlier. Um, and if you move on to the next slide, um, actually, I don't like this slide. It's kind of ugly. Um, um, uh, <laughs> um, actually, go back to it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, that area became, be, um, became known as the preferred habitat of then the Brutus whale, now the Rhesus whale. Um, so those recordings were then used to document, to, to get the original documentation of the repertoire of the Rhesus whale. Um, and cataloging a repertoire is very important in, uh, in marine biology and specifically with whales. Um, and uh, here's, a, here's the first paper, Potential Brides Whale Calls Recorded in the Northern Gulf of Mexico by Aaron Rice, different Rice. Um, he's out of Cornell, super nice dude, um, in their Institute of Bioacoustics. Um, and I think you can go to the next slide now. And what he presented were these first um, spectrograms, these visualizations of Rice's whale songs. And um, one thing you'll see in this presentation is the way the technology has advanced. And, um, but we get these first ever documentations of potential Rice's whale calls, and they, um, they put them in three ways. Down sweep sweet sequences, which are these long down sweeps, long moans, um, and tonal sequences. Um, and what this paper did was it established a re repertoire and it advocated for increased funding for passive acoustic monitoring to better understand this population in the Gulf, um, and specifically the risks that they are posed by anthropogenic sound. One thing I didn't say, uh, earlier is that when these whales are recognized as a species, it was really bittersweet because they, are also re they were also recognized as one of the most endangered species on the planet. Um, at that, the, the population is estimated to be 15 to 100 individuals. I have some hope because that number keeps rising in this way. Um, but we see these first tonal sequences. And we can move on to the next one. Um, and what that data also gave us was some insight into the ways that these whales are uniquely impacted by anthropogenic sound. The Gulf of Mexico, as we all know, is a hotbed of oil activity, of shipping, of ship, tra ship traffic. Um, and this is just, a, this is a map. The, you know, the hotter the colors get, the more active, specifically vessel traffic and seismic survey noises. Um, anthropogenic sound is a term that's used to say sound created by human activities. Some people also say capitalogenic sound. Um, uh, but it's, it's kind of agreed that anthropogenic sound has increased in the ocean over the past 50 years with an estimated doubling every decade. Um, uh, and I'm skipping ahead in the science, but this, um, this next quote uh, is from an important study released by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. Um, essentially, when they listed the overall threat raking for anthropogenic noise as medium high uh, for these whales. Um, and that is because when the, when the scientists documented their songs, they sing in some really unique ways, including really low. Um, if you go, can we go back to those? those so you see on the left, that's uh, pitch, that's frequency. Um, and they start generally at around 150 hertz, which is about a D3, which is about a D3. And then they swoop down. Um, low frequency sound travels really well underwater. You can move forward. Um, and uh, you can go to the next one, actually. Um, and the next one, even. Um, one of the most catastrophic sounds is that of seismic surveys. I meant to put a picture of a seismic study unit in this, but I didn't. 
Um, but basically, it's been documented pretty much 24 hours a day, every day of the year in the Gulf of Mexico. The oil industry is, is using these boats, pulling behind them an air gun, a giant gun that's pointed down at the floor of the ocean. And every, 15 to, every 10 to 30 seconds in the Gulf of Mexico, it fires off and uses sound, uses the pressure of air to map the ocean floor. Um, and uh, we, this, is, this event is called Gulf of Mexico, Gulf Coast Acoustomologies. Acoustomologies is an academic term that essentially means ways of knowing through sound. Uh, and I like to think, I don't like to, but I do think of the Gulf of Mexico as a place of com competing acoustomologies, competing means of knowing through sound with very devastating consequences. Um, there's a range of impact to the sound of a seismic gun. Um, beings in the line of fire can be killed. Less, less severe biologic, bi but less severe physical injury further out, um, and then the further you get out, it just increases the ambient noise le level of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so right here, these things on the left are actually divided in seven. So the colorful one is the top of each one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So these are correlated to the, the recording units from earlier. And so the red, whenever you see red, that's a hit of the seismic gun. And basically what you'll see when there's multiple reds across a vertical space, it's really demonstrating that, that, some that when seismic guns are fired off the coast of Texas, they are audible off the coast of Florida. And that tells you how much low frequency sound travels underwater. Um, and so you'll see on, this, on the right, that's just a zoomed in 120 second fragment of a day you know, and that's a hit pretty much every 10 seconds. Um, I have access to a lot of raw data of recordings of the Gulf of Mexico, just like 24-hour recordings. And if you just like scroll in, it's just red at the bottom. And often, more often than not, the sound of an air gun is present either distant or as foreground noise. Yeah. Um, yeah, move on. Uh, and then I'm going to speed through the next thing. Oh, yeah, you can, you can move on. Thank you. Um, uh, we can go to the next thing. This is just saying that anthropogenic sound is bad. Um, this is a really exciting study. Go back to that one. This is where I want to get to. Y'all, so the collection of the sound has been really important. It's, it's generated more funding and more interest in, in, in the rice's whale, in the Gulf, in the whale, the baleen of the Gulf of Mexico, of many and no known names. And, um, so much so that they started putting recording units across the Gulf of Mexico in places where there were unconfirmed sightings. Um, and whereas just a couple of ye years ago they were estimating the population at 15 to 50, now they're saying 15 to 100. And if you move to the next slide, um, you'll see the circled area is the De Soto Canyon, where, they, where they, they were thought to be their primary habitat. And then this western front area is where they've started doing some studies. And if you move forward, uh, the, the most exciting news and interesting thing has happened. And it is that, you know, those three variations of a call that I showed you earlier, the whales in the western part of the Gulf of Mexico have wild diversity of calls. Um, that are not really seen in, their, in, in the whales that are closer to us. Um, so the eastern at the top is the standard one that we know, but then they've got all these other new things that are happening in the west, new to us, a dip, hills, dents, drops, slope, slope dents. Um, and it raises some interesting questions. One, 70 years ago, it was fringe to say they existed, but wait, are there distinct populations of these whales in the Gulf of Mexico? Um, 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 do these whales interact? Do they migrate between places? Are they distinct? Um, and it's also raising some questions around anthropogenic noise, too, because one thing you'll see in these top two, you know, I said that their main frequency is at 150 hertz, 
But these middle two right here, if you can see at the top above 200, do you all see that little sliver of yellow? That is a harmonic. And if, if you all know the harmonic, if you're familiar with the harmonic series, 225 isn't the natural harmonic of 150. It is the second partial of 75. And you'll see down here, at the bottom one, you see a line around 75. There's actually some specul there's suggestion now that actually the Rice's whales fundamentally sing lower than we thought that they do, um, and that the tone that is coming through is actually a harmonic, and that, that these whales sing um, at, a, at a D quarter sharp, sharp two. Um, uh, why is that significant? Well, one, because it's cool, because they're singing in this harmonic spectrum, um, and two, because uh, it, I told, acoustic masking is one of the effects of, of anthropogenic noise. Basically, acoustic masking, we all experience it during Mardi Gras, when we're raising our voices to be heard in a party context, when there's noise and there's bands, and you start losing your voice. Um, when these whales are fundamentally singing at 75 hertz, they have to force themselves to be heard even greater than we expected, you know? This is all speculation, but this is just what I'm into right now. Um, uh, and then, I don't think there's really anything else. Let's see. Oh, yeah. What also, the thing about those whales that are in the, in, in the West, uh, we th they think that there's less of them, and they're also much more at risk. Um, the West, is like there's more, more pipelines, more uh, platforms, just more traffic. Um, yeah, they're threatened by anthropogenic sound, but they are also one of their main threats is ship collision. They like to sleep close to the surface under the stars. Um, and so greater focus, hopefully, is being put on these whales in the West um, because they're greater vulnerability. Uh, we can go on. I won't talk about this more, but this is just some interesting, or some of the first studies of whale song. He says humpback whales, um, and you can just kind of go through quick. It's just some cool seismographs. Um, and also, like, just thanking the, the researchers. Uh, Melissa Soldavia is really, really doing her thing at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we should make some music. Um, so some context real quick. Um, what y'all are about to experience is the second workshop performance of Reverie for the Baleen of the Gulf of Mexico of many and no known names. Um, I want to give a thank you to Dr. Fraser. Denise, where you, where you go? Oh. Um, and <laughs> Dr. Renee Anderson over here. Um, the first iteration of this piece was for all five of us. Um, and because we were selected to perform this at a festival, New Music on the Bayou, on June 2nd, um, and the limit was three performers, we're using this as a workshop opportunity to experiment with doing this piece for just, with just three people. Uh, Clementine had the brilliant idea of uh, bringing her loop pedal. Um, yeah, uh, what we do with this piece uh, is there's this whole slew of extended techniques inside and outside of the piano to demonstrate acoustic, to demonstrate anthropogenic sound, to treat the spectrograms that we just saw as sheet music, to play these whale songs. All the while, uh, Peter is doing some really brilliant uh, sound spatialization around y'all. We have a surround sound eight channel set up around y'all. Um, and that's not just for cool effects. Well, it's great. It's for an immersive experience, but also, Distance and proximity to sound is so important in this realm. Um, and so, yeah, I've just seen a little glimpse of sort of the, the academic practice I got, I'm trying to get going on. Um, and I'm, I've been developing this creative practice with these folks. And it's, um, here we are. Feel good? <laughs>
Uh, one thing I didn't mention is
mentioned that that piece involves uh, recordings obtained from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, so that was actual rice as whales calls um, that you were hearing as well, as, all, as well as actual anthropogenic sound from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, time check. We still got time for the little, little performance lab, or what's our time looking like? Maybe let's do like a eight minute lap. Okay, come hang out a little thing for y'all. So for this, I need volunteers. I need people. Raise your hand if you're willing to come up here and try making some noises on the piano. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who can whistle? Yeah, got your Let's bring some people too. Andre, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's without experience. Okay, so. I actually got a credit out of the chart because between our last performance and this one, I started thinking like, a lot about reinforcing the sounds that we make in the piano with breath. I don't know if you heard during the, the there's supposed to be waves at the beginning of this. Is that what you're going to So this is a piece of paper in the piano, like that, but then I'm also using my breath, breathing in and out, this like slight whistle tone to it to kind of spatialize it more. I'm, I'm thinking of an ocean as I'm doing it. So I'm going to come here. No, no, I can hold it. Is it better now? Can you hear me? OK, so with your hand, wouldn't you? Come, come over here. Can you do some like tonal breathing? Yeah, exactly. Now, yeah, yeah. Should I be making the Yeah, so kind of what I'm doing with that is I'm like, my baseline is like a low, slow kind of, I'm picturing the tide like pulling back, right? And then as the waves crash, you can kind of imagine the rhythm, put yourself on the beach and leave it flat and just with your fingertips. Yeah, and then you can make a big swell. Yeah, here's what I wanna do. I wanna set a loop. Part of the reason this is so difficult is because we have to keep the mic super hot. The uh, sounds are really delicate. Get your face in there. Start making noise with your mouth. Thank you. Now we have an ocean. So that's a little big hand for Dr. Vera Raghavan. OK, then we, we've got some anthropogenic sounds that start to come in. So we, we've been calling them spectral sweeps. But I want you to take this. Stand over there. I'm not being too bossy, am I? OK, so on these low strings, just kind of drag it slowly. Push hard. You hear that? That's like a, I think of like some sort of industrial thing, something you don't want happening like where you live, probably. Awesome, keep doing that. Show us your bowing chops. It's like the oil industry is right here in the room with us, isn't it? Dr. Vera Raghavan, can I interest you in doing some seismic studies underneath the piano? All right, so <laughs> you're gonna crawl under there. Yeah. And so I'm using, yeah, that one and the timpani mallet as well, grab it. 
with one hand, you're gonna smack just this part of the mallet against the top, and then the timpani mallet hold up, up and down, and you're gonna kind of stab. You do it at the same time, really hard. Don't worry about hurting the piano. Just go really, really hard. Yeah! And that could kill a whale. It's really sad. Again, again. On the next one, stop. On the next one, stop. One more time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. Oh yeah, I forgot about the, the whale. So, so every piano is different. When we're doing, when we were rehearsing, we didn't have this space, we were working on a different piano. And some of the techniques, they don't carry over. Um, it, it can be really challenging trying to compose a piece that's so, I, I've never worked on something that's so instrument specific as this. And so some of the mallets don't make the same sounds on different pianos. Um, we're lucky to have a lot of really beautiful grand pianos at Tulane. Um, but these spectrograms, I was kind of treating them like sheet music, as Diane was saying. So This is a two hand thing. There's the kind of D. I'm kind of going for like a D quarter strap. It, it's hard, it's a friction mallet, so. And it swoops down. See how close that was? Pretty close. So, it's just pressure, friction mallet. Um, yeah, I don't really know what else to say about that. It's, it's really fun to work on this. I, I've had an awesome time um, doing it, but... One thing kind of about... just following along with the curvature on the graph. Yeah, do you have a question? I was trying to get it actually here. The sound that the sound that I came in first with. This isn't my preferred mallet to use, but I tend to drop things. Uh, I tried to get. I've been struggling with the sound today. So in the long tone, and then in the, the sweeps. kind of work, both in terms of this realm of music making. We have another piece called Exit 7, um, and then hopefully more, um, but also big dreams around uh, these big waves. So yeah. All right, yeah. Thank you.
And Demi Ward, for our last segment of the evening, will present uh, information and context about the piece that was playing when we came in this evening and that will be playing when, when um, we move on. And we, I want to go ahead right now and invite you to a reception that's going to follow um, Demi's comments and piece. And um, I just thank everyone for coming to this evening and this uh, celebration of the Anthroposonic series and the long and um, evolving history of music and sound here at Tulane and with the Center for the Gulf South. Thank you, um, Corey Diane, Clementine, and Peter. That was, I always love listening to that piece. Um, so when Rebecca and Denise invited me on the kayaking trip in Lily Bayou, um, I was thinking a lot about field recording and using those raw recordings as like a basis for sound. Now, the thing about field recording is it's different than recording in a studio. Obviously, everything was a lot muddier. Um, and in the process of like processing all these all these clips, I was kind of going back and forth between my understanding and kind of training for like purity in sound, um, which given like the, the tools and like what I had didn't really seem possible. And instead I decided to lean into the muddiness, lean into, um, this kind of like underground, noisy feel that all these clips had, and it brought me to thoughts of the subaltern, the subterranean, um, and informed the way that I processed the clips, and also how I used um, the voice um, as another instrument. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, Citizenship from below, it's a concept that I've been talking a lot about um, in my Black Diaspora culture class, and wanted to think instead about what like a revolution from below would sound like, what it would feel like, um, what does protest from below sound like, what does it feel like, and how those things, the voices that we've heard, the things that we remember, um, and the things that resonate with us, how they carry on through time. Even though you might not be able to individually piece a piece back to like, you know, like your grandmother told you this specific thing, but you've actually heard it from like five diff different people. This idea of overlapping voices, um, telling you the same thing over and over and over again um, was really powerful to me. And I really wanted to focus um, on, on that particular understanding. Um, I ended up using uh, the um, the legend, the local legend of Bra Coupe as a kind of like launching point to think about the subaltern um, and think about revolution from below um, and his relationship um, mythologically to the swamp um, as a site that like I was field recording and then thinking about, okay, well like I'm talking about the swamp here or this, this story is about the swamp. What does the swamp sound like? Um, yeah, so. That's, that's what was going through my head <laughs> for this work in progress. Um, and I hope you all have enjoyed Anthroposonic so far. And let's take a little listen, shall we?
Again, thank you everyone for coming this evening and, um, and being with us. We hope that this um, listening experience and gathering invites us all to consider not only our um, music and sounds made during the colonial period uh, to, through today, but also the, the longer indigenous timeline that stretches beyond those barriers and also our geological timeline and sounds that have been in existence in this place. Please join us for a reception outside to celebrate these gorgeous artists um, who have come together. And I also just want to point out this, this area of um, incredible faculty members that have been mentioned tonight. We're so glad you made it. Um, and we know it's the end of the semester and um, there's a lot been going on. So it's just, it's an honor and privilege to work with y'all and to have you here tonight. Okay. Oh, yeah, so enjoy. 